I'm assuming that means we're on, but I haven't done this before, so I'm just going to assume that we're on. Someone tell me in the chat that we, we must be. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Uh, welcome to um, day two of the NHSR conference, the Lightning Talks. Uh, we've got loads of interesting talks coming up, so I won't take too much time saying this. A word to the speakers. I'm going to be keeping us rigidly to time. Uh, and in order to do that, I would normally obviously hold up a little sign that says three minutes left, but I can't do that because you won't see me because it's virtual. So I'm afraid I will be cutting across you at the seven minute mark. I'll be talking every talk, which is terribly, horribly rude. And I apologize sincerely, but I'm doing it to keep everyone to time. So, uh, yes, Mohammed says he can hear me loud and clear. Everyone says that I'm loud. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so with no more ado, let's start with uh, Richard Issett, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at Great Ormond Street. Oh, and questions in the chat. Thanks very much. Uh, hopefully you can now see this, so we should see how it goes. Um, basically, yes, I am a researcher on the Grammar Street, and this is just a sort of whistle-stop tour of how I've used R to look at patients who have got uh, COVID-19. So basically, with this, we work within something called the digital research environment. So unfortunately, it's a third-party uh, system, but this is to by with a lot of governance issues um, with using very sensitive uh, data. So all the stuff will be online in terms of R, but we have to look at it behind a closed wall. So one of the things that we were very interested in doing in the early days is looking to see if the children that we saw at a specialist children's hospital have the same sort of clinical signs and symptoms as some of the adults that we've seen. So whether or not there's a over-representation of the black and Asian minority ethnicities, uh, whether or not this is more of an inflammatory kind of syndrome, and whether there's uh, predispositions to something like, you know, vitamin D deficiency and how that sort of links with everything. So we use the uh, tidyverse reader packages, as I think most people tend to do these days, um, and particularly the R statics passage, uh, which mainly I use because it's quite friendly. And I'm a clinician, I'm not a, uh, you know, a like or hard uh, R user, um, only relatively new to it. So this, for me, makes it a lot easier because I can read it as I would do in English. Um, and uh, I know apologies for those of you who don't like doing this, but anyway, for us, it was easy to sort of put these things into the R package and then pull out some of the key details, such as, you know, the patients we saw are fairly, uh, you know, obese that we're seeing. So, you know, much like adults, we're seeing these sort of signs and symptoms, again, in pediatrics. And this thing called C-reactive protein, I don't worry too much about it, but it's an inflammatory marker. And as you can see, it's very, very high in our COVID positive groups. And also it's quite interesting that we noticed that all the patients who were coming through had total vitamin D levels. Now, using this prop test within the pipe work, we can actually see that although we do have more BAME patients in both the COVID positive and negative groups, the proportions aren't different. So we're not seeing an over overrepresentation of BAME in patients in our groups. So what I wanted to do is not only use the R suite to you know do some analysis, but you know we all know how good R is at producing some fantastic plots. And one of the reasons I like this particular plot is called a rain cloud plot. And it uses cloud plot, uh, military R, plot tricks, GG simply and GT pipe R. And the idea of this is that not only do you see the raw data in terms of the dots with the you know overlaid box plot, so you give you some sort of summary statistics, but then you then can see right next to it the actual distribution behind the data. And I think this is something that is quite often missed. Um, and unfortunately, with a lot of other publications, so you know you're kind of hiding behind the data. Whereas this, you know, it's it's very easy to look at and see. Well, okay, there's a bit of a hump there, and there's a hump there. So you can see the differences in distributions. And essentially, all you're losing is uh, half a flat vial input with GM point and GM box plot. So the coding actually is relatively easy to use. You, know, you just set your, uh, your numerical values as your um, your categorical variables and then offset it on the uh, x-axis so that's actually really really quite easy to use and then it does give quite a nice over representation of what's going on one of the things i love about r is that it doesn't take a leap from doing that to then maybe slightly more complicated aspects so looking at a load of uh, laboratory data which we know is can be very very dependent uh, not only about what the disease you have but also in terms of your individual physiology and so using the LME4 package, um, we used uh, or created uh, called linear mixed effects regression models. So the idea of this is that you're giving essentially a, a slight random effect 
for each different patient because these are going to be repeated measures. And so you, what you want to do is allow it to give you the within patient measurements um, rather than just an aggregated summary of that patient. So you can get use all the data rather than just an aggregated version. And again, it's very, very simple to do to split the laboratory settings by the individual factors and then make your essentially your full model, which can be in this case, whether or not they are COVID positive or COVID negative, add in that random effect of the patient themselves, which is this one slash hustle number group, and then compare that to just the patient themselves and take out that aspect of what their diagnosis is. And then this lets you allow to uh, look at the likelihood ratio to see what effects are there, which was really nice to see. So you can really find out that, uh, sorry, let's go back a second, is that you can see this idea of the C-reactive protein. So this inflammatory marker is raised again. So you can see the difference there as well as some of the uh, protein functions. So it's very, very typical of what we're seeing in the adult population is also then translating down to the pediatric groups. So what kind of gives this sort of underlying disease severity, you know, what, what aspects of it? We know that the vitamin D is lower in these patient groups. How can we then find out what well, is that got to do with the disease severity? Or is this just, uh, you know, something to do with the fact we don't have much sunshine in the UK? So using a multivariable linear regression, which we've all seen before, particularly judged by age, gender, the severity scores, so when they first come in, how badly do you think they are? And, and this inflammatory marker C-reactive protein, and whether or not there is an element of the I suppose, white versus um, BME group. However, life isn't quite that simple. So it's very difficult to pull out one single factor when you're using all these. And particularly, we know that vitamin D is associated with COVID-19 levels in terms of it's very, very low. We also know that the inflammatory response is linked to COVID-19. So are we, are we seeing a bit of bias? And you know, how will we then look at the direct, that is the indirect effects of vitamin D? And so we used the mediation analysis from the mediation package to kind of get that. So the idea of this is that we're now going to super streamline them and try and work out where the connections go in a more linear model. And to do this, what you're doing is you're looking at your, your independent and your dependent variables, and then your independent variables and your mediated variables, such as the vitamin D, for example, and then combining all three of them to see how these linear questions stack up. And you're comparing the models to find out where the significant effects occurs. And so what we actually found by running this is that there was no evidence that the vitamin D level was actually mediating this higher inflammatory response in COVID-19. It just happens to be there. That's three minutes. Yeah, uh, this is the last slide, so look at that. Um, so using, we use the R statics package um, for really sort of pipe-friendly statistical comparisons, modeling um, regression using you know, for vitamin D levels, just using a base package as well, and the enemy 4 mediation package for really getting down to the other linear mix effects models, or to look at those direct or indirect effects of vitamin D on, on the information that we see. And also using the CalPlot differentials we discussed earlier, you get these really nice rain cloud plots, which then give you this far better, more informative visualizations. And so where do we go from now? Well, now we've uh, done sort of the COVID work, we want to go and do this new paediatric syndrome that's arising at the moment, um, which unfortunately is making some children very, very ill. So as soon as I know that, hopefully we'll be back next year to tell you what we find out. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much. So there's a few questions from the chat. So the first one is about um, uncoded ethnicity. So I'm going to make the question a bit bigger, actually. So someone's asked about, um, does your you've got white group and black and minority ethnic group. Uh, what have you done with uncoded ethnicities? And in general, so is, was missing data a problem? Have you actually got good data for ethnicity in your data set? Uh, we have, mainly because with something like this, uh, our infectious disease population was, they were, or department rather, were really hot on making sure that, you know, there was no, no stone left unturned into the data. So everything is going through and they made sure that there was no missing data, which is unheard of as far as I'm aware in anything that I've ever done before. So I, I will tip my hat to them and say, good job, because um, they went through and went, made sure that everything was filled in uh, because they needed to know what was going to happen with this. Uh, so this was all, all the data from the first wave um, of coming through. So I think there was a real emphasis on, on making sure that we, we had proper data in order to work on. Cool. And the other question is about the LMA4 models. Yeah. So you've done lots of univariate models. Uh, the question is, did you do a full conditional model with all the predictors in the same model? 
we d we did a limited amount, mainly because and it sounds like a cop out on that one. I'm not sure. I'm sorry about that. Uh, mainly because there were so many different variables that people were putting forward in terms of what we should be using, that it it well it got beyond the point of you know there was I think there was about sort of 170 different variables that people said well it could be this. And at that point, you just it was going to be too too far. So we what we did was try and clear out what we knew was going to be a sort of multicollinearity problem. So we focused down on on the the aspects that was going to be what we thought was the full model. So for example, that multivariate uh, vitamin D model, for example, were the key aspects that we thought were well, those are going to be the main predictors. That was essentially our full um, our full uh, what am I talking about? Full uh, data set. Yeah, that was going to be the full model. Okay, great. Well, we're going to press right on. So thanks very much for the talk. Uh, that was really good. Much. I have to say in the chat, there's a lot of props going on for your data department, which is always nice to see, isn't it? Because they're <laughs> un unsung heroes. So well done they for are. bringing them to light. Um, so our next speaker, I'm assuming is going to appear magically next to me as I'm talking, is uh, Alan Young uh, from Public Health Scotland. And he's going to be talking about an R package for templates. And here he is. Um, two seconds. <clears throat> Is that all come up okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So my name's uh, Alan Young. I'm just going to talk uh, quickly about a package that we developed in Public Health Scotland called PHS Templates. And this is just a package to hold templates for doing some sort of common tasks like annual reports and uh, creating projects a bit more efficiently in the organization. So uh, first thing I'll start with is some acknowledgements. I know it usually goes at the end, but I didn't do a lot of the work for this. Uh, a lot of the work was developed by Transforming Publishing Team in PHS. Um, I just done the fun part, which was to put some R code around it. <laughs> um, so what is PHS templates? It's just currently a package that holds uh, a few different templates. One to set up a, a sort of recommended project structure. One with an R script with some uh, preset parts in it and uh, one to do some uh, PHS annual reports. Um, all of this has been designed to make it relatively simple to use for beginners. So you can access these from the menus in RStudio. And to interact with the menus in RStudio, you use something called a DCF file, which just looks like uh, what I've got in the pictures there. So you, you set little parameters like things for offer, and they'll appear in your new project wizard uh, when that comes up. So. Why did we create PHS templates? Um, it's to remove some of the pain of adopting best practice in the organization, particularly for beginners, which because uh, R can be quite difficult to get started with. I've got this picture, I always remember Hadley Wickham giving these talks, uh, where he tries to uh, create tools that help people to fall into this pit of success. And uh, that's the whole idea about trying to do things like PHS templates. And we've got another package called PHS Methods in Public Health Scotland, just to help people to um, adopt best practice more easily. I can't claim to have helped even 1% as much as Hadley was, has, but hopefully I've helped a bit. Um, so PHS templates also makes it a bit easier to follow a kind of reproducible workflow, which I think is uh, sort of more important than ever these days, just to make all your work auditable and everything. Also makes it easier for collaboration and portability uh, because some of the templates remind you to fill in things like uh, metadata, which I think is important. Um, the project template helps with things like security because it will create things like a, a git ignore file for you, which will stop you from pushing things onto GitHub, like common data file types and um, things like that. And of course, putting it into a package uh, helps to improve discover discoverability of uh, our work and tools being developed in PHS. One of the hardest things to do is to get people to notice your work actually. So I think it helps a bit there. So the project template is uh, just a, a kind of thing that will set up directories for you uh, for every new project. So we'll have a directory for your code and for your data, as you see on the right there. Uh, it's intended to be flexible, so you don't need to follow this completely strictly, but it helps you to create a structure that lots of different people can use within the organization. The actual R code to do this project template is, is relatively simple, just uh, two commands mainly, dir.create to create folders and write lines to populate sort of templates within files. So everything's on GitHub if you ever wanted to check it out. 
Um, the R script template just looks like this. So we've got lots of lines at the top, which are things about your script, uh, who wrote the script, what the script does, the version of R that you're using. And all of that is particularly useful for yourself if you don't come back to your work for a while or if you're collaborating with others, um, especially if you're not using GitHub uh, or Git uh, tools like that. And lots of people in the organization still aren't sort of trained in Git. So I think it's quite good for getting people uh, into these good practices. Um, the most complicated thing in the package is probably these report templates. <laughs> so to do uh, annual reports, this is basically just an R markdown document with the output set as a Word document. Um, but it obviously references a style document, which will do all the styling required for uh, PHF reports. Um, there's a few tricks in there, such as these sort of HTML tags that help you to um, access custom styles that you set up. A quick note about the templates is they do require RStudio version 1.2, which comes with a piece of software called Pandoc version 2. And this helps you to do things like page breaks and to access newer packages like Flextable, which will help you to do um, lots and lots of customization for your tables in MS Word. Um, it also utilizes a package called Officer, which is written by the same person as the person who wrote Flextable. This is uh, used for annual reports to do some finishing touches like uh, combining the front cover and adding in the table of contents. So a few things are planned to finish up things such as writing some vignettes for, for uh, using these R markdown templates, uh, some common things for packages like unit tests and code coverage, etc. We want to add in more templates such as uh, an IO slides template, shiny template and the leaflet template. I think all of these already exist in PHS, but just nobody's done the work to put them in yet. <laughs> and of course, this is an open source project, so everybody's welcome to contribute to uh, documentation, reporting issues, uh, adding features. And if anybody's creative, I think a hex logo might be quite nice. So if I've got any time left at all, um, I could try to do a quick demo. Um, but I might need to change my screen share. Four minutes. Uh, all right, um, I'm not sure how to change my screen share. <laughs> um, probably. Has that come up at all? Yeah. So the first thing I'll show is, is to get the script template. It's just in this add-ins menu. Um, and we have a new PHS R script and it just comes up with a box, just put in the offer and you'll get your template appearing. So it's just quite easy to access these. And the second thing is the new project, which you'll get from new project menu. Um, everything seems to go a wee bit slower when you're sharing your screen. But, um, so there should be one called PHS R project. Um, and I'll just call it test. And we can do things like initializing with Git um, as well. And there's also option to use this package called Ren for package management. So it's hopefully all quite nice and easy to, to get started with these things. Um, so creating a new project. So that's already in your, your your basic code template comes up and you've got these folders there. And the final one, if I have time, is the R markdown. Um, so I'll just call this, uh, I'll just put this into downloads. I'll just call this test two. And I will need to change my working directory. <laughs> so I've got a little R script here called create report. So it sticks everything together, including your front cover um, and all that. So once you've done that, you just run. It will compile it all up with your template for your PHF report. And 
you'll get a nice little thing that will come up with some warnings from MS Word, but you can just ignore these. Um, it's basically because it's creating a table of contents, but everything will look uh, quite nice. And all you need to do is edit the R mark down and you would get your report for the thing that you want. But all these templates do is help you to get started. And uh, yeah, everything here can be edited so that you could do it for your own type of report. So um, that's basically it from me. So. Great. Thanks very much. Well, everyone's very enthusiastic in the chat. There's a poll being created that everybody wants you to do a workshop. So you may have talked uh, yourself into some extra work there, I'm afraid. And oh, certainly my team, I think, will definitely be building one of these by the end of the year because it looks pretty great. All right. Uh, I didn't think it would have so much interest. But, um, <laughs> okay. um, so Zoe's asking in the chat, what's the GitHub name? So maybe you could just pop that in the chat for people. And yeah. I've just got one little question for you, which is, is this, um, are you agnostic to file systems? So will this work across Linux, Mac, and Windows? Um, I have tested this on the RStudio server, which is a, a Linux based, so it does work fine on that as well. So yeah, should it should be fine. Cool. Um, <laughs> right. Well, thanks very much. Thanks. Um, I'll pop the GitHub link on in a second. Great. Thanks. OK, so moving swiftly on, uh, we now have um, Edna Mwenda. Um, who will be talking about applied survival analysis. Uh, there's a, there was a question that came in too late, so maybe you can answer that in the chat. Hi, everyone. My name is Edna Mwenda from Kenya. I'll be talking about survival analysis. There's a little bit of echo. Is that on your side, Edna? I can see here the echo. OK, let me just check. If you're having more than two, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's not everyone. If you have more than two tabs open with Crowdcast, it might start echoing within itself. Uh, so please make sure if you have Crowdcast, it's only from one tab. So Edna, do you have only one tab open with Crowdcast? Is that better? Could you yes, say I do have one tab. But it's it is it Uh, well, it didn't echo before, so what I think we'll do now is we'll move to Eugene, and I will quickly send you a message, Edna, on Slack so we can see what we can do, if you don't mind. Uh, but if Eugene is here as well on the stage. Hi. Great. So, right. Uh, okay, so now we have uh, Eugene Hickey talking about the power of data visualization in R. Take it away. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be at this conference. Well, good afternoon from Dublin, by the way. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be at this conference. I'll have to say, it's so far, I've been so impressed with the pre presenters and uh, the organization has been tremendous. And having a cat as being kind of on, on the chair, I think, is a, is a good innovation. But, uh, we should always take that out. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So the topic of my topic is data visualization, and um, it's a short talk, but I want to try and like shoehorn in kind of three major takeaways. Uh, the first being that when we have data in R, it it tells a story, and part of data visualization is to help us kind of uh, tell that narrative. Uh, and often, like with a visualization, like you have like one big blockbuster picture which kind of captures the entire thing. But more generally, kind of it's a sequence of different kind of uh, visuals that walk us through kind of the, the story from our data. So if I can screen share here and give you an example. Can you guys see that? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you see like has it gone full screen right now? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna begin with like the 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 the, the paying of the camera payments data set just as an example. Uh, and here we have it. It kind of captures uh, three different species of penguins uh, and captures their physical parameters. And three they are like penguins, but. Um, 
they don't see it that way. So we present our data, first of all. Uh, we tell our audience about our data. So for example, their the flipper lengths, we can have we plot uh, density plots of, of their flipper length. And we can see that they are different across the different species. And that's true for both males and for females. We then let our audience kind of uh, like explore the data. So we kind of present other plots, which kind of tell us more about the, 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 the substance of our data. And we can see over here, for example, that the, the uh, Adelie penguins seem to have like, shorter bill lengths. And the Chincha penguins seem to have like, longer flippers. So we let our audience kind of explore our data. Uh, and when that is done, we then kind of come to a conclusion of our story and let us know, like we, we, we built a model, in this case it's a random forest model. And indeed kind of it, it is bill length and flipper length are the most important variables for to distinguish our penguins. So I guess that the, 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 the takeaway from this is that R tells a story and that our visuals, like as we walk through a series of visual, visualizations, they kind of, they unfold, they, 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 they showcase our, the, the characters of our story they let our audience explore what they are, and then they come to a conclusion. That's kind of the story arc kind of through a suite of visualizations. That's our first takeaway. The second one is that um, with R, it kind of gives us a, a vast range of choices for you know, how we might do that. So there's lots of ways of looking at data. So uh, I'm going to split that into three parts, the, the traditional, uh, maybe more complex ones, and then the more bespoke one. Uh, every kind of presentation should have a which have a, a graphic from uh, Alison Horst, and this is this is mine. Uh, I've got to say right away that uh, the content of what I'm saying right now is more appropriate to ggplot too, because that's what I know best. But I kind of believe it's probably true across the entire R spectrum. So traditional plots, I mean by things like histograms and bar plots and, and dot plots, you can see them all over here, and R does them very well, and it it lets us kind of build these plots and enhance them and make them more visually engaging, but yet keeps them substantive. Uh, like, and it also kind of promotes good practice within our visual. For example, you might have seen in the penguins that uh, we, as far as possible, we present our raw data, and we helped our 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 our, our listeners kind of to pick out kind of features by grouping our data together. So R is kind of good traditional kind of plotting. It also has more more, more complex ones. I want to kind of uh, show some of these right now. Here's an animation. This is looking at the different NHS regions and how they how their bed occupancy changed over several weeks last winter. You can see them swapping around over the course of the, the season. Uh, moving on then, like this, uh, building on this, the same data, we have networks. These can link together the STPs and the NHS. Looking at bed occupancy, uh, looking at how different STPs kind of, if they have the same profile of bed occupancy across the, uh, across the, the weeks of last winter. Uh, we have annotations. This is a simple bar chart, um, but we have uh, put on top of this, uh, some graphics. So we're looking at tweets which featured NHS and which had emojis. And what were the most common emojis in these tweets? And not surprisingly, kind of the the, the, the top winner was were face masks and on down the line. Um, moving on, R does maps and does maps very well. There's like a, a, a number of packages in R for maps. Uh, this is looking at tuberculosis in Africa. It's also an animation. So over several years, how uh, the incident rates of tuberculosis changed. Uh, we have word clouds. Um, these are uh, the genes which are being connected to schizophrenia, and they're kind of arranged out in a shape which should uh, recall uh, the shape of the brain. So these are kind of more complicated plots. And then on top of that, there's the third category would be ones which are more uh, for specific specializations. So for example, um, you have those same genes again, but now they're laid out on our chromosomes. This is where they sit on top of our chromosomes in a karyogram. So R gives us a, a vast range of different ways of showing our data, lots of different kind of uh, plotting types. Uh, we have a great deal of choice when we want to tell the story that our data has. And the last takeaway I want to put out today is that this is all kind of qu quite not simple, but straightforward to do. And in large measure, that's because the the ethos of the R community is to, is to share. Uh, and not just sharing code, I mean, that's nice as well, but uh, there's the ethos of our creative ideas, putting that out there. Uh, for me, kind of my, my go-to places are those three sites right there, our weekly, our stats, and our bloggers. They're kind of compendia resources. But when you can put them on a regular basis, you can identify people who are in areas which are more, more specific to your interests and your work areas. Uh, so I can tell them on a regular basis. I'm going to finish by saying that, um, true to that philosophy, pretty much all I've shown you right there now has, has been inspired by other people. 
And I want to mention in particular like Shannon Pelleggi, who kind of had this, this idea of having a presentation using a flex dashboard. Uh, Alison Horse, we've mentioned already. She's actually speaking on Thursday, and I'm, that's, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing her talk. And I want to kind of mention uh, Fiona Grimm from the Health Foundation, uh, who did all the work for putting the NHS data in, in a shape to be able to, I mean, able to visualizations. So just to kind of to, to recap, um, the three takeaways are that within our, when we have a visual, it should tell a story, it should unfold a story. Uh, that we have lots of choices for doing that, kind of by, by different brands of visualizations. And lastly, that that's uh, because of our sense of community, uh, that it uh, makes it quite straightforward to do that. Uh, that's Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Great. Thanks very much. Well, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, so the first one is, how did you create those visualizations that looked more hand-drawn? <laughs> well, um, it's I, I like playing with fonts. Um, so uh, that font in a lot of the visualizations was, was done by Ink Free, so it kind of looks like more like like, like handwriting. Um, I think that's a large part of it, and it kind of I think it's it's again it's a part of the way of, of drawing your listener into the, the the visual. And there's another question about accessibility. Do you have resources to check to see whether visualizations are accessible, for example, with colors and text? I'm not quite sure what you mean. So in terms of say color blindness, for example. Oh yes, uh, so there are um, there are two R packages for for, for colorblindness. Um, one's called R Colorblind Check, and uh, one's just like all R Colorblind. Uh, R Colorblind Check is quite nice. You could, you could send a palette into into that uh, uh, into function there, and it'll kind of show you what they'll look like for people with uh, utanopia or putanopia or, or, or different kind of colorblind uh, conditions. Um, so yeah, uh, and there's a there there are palettes which are designed for people with colorblindness, like the Verdes package, for example, is. It's very good that way. Yeah, it might be it might be an effect of typefaces as well. I hadn't thought about it until they asked the question. Actually, I don't know if you've yeah. ever thought about that. Um, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we're running up to time. So I'll oh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Move thank on you. to the next speaker. Just while I'm filling, there's another question in the chat, which is, "What is my cat called?" Uh, <laughs> she was called Pavlov, but Anastasia tells me that's wrong because she's a woman and it's a Russian name, so her name is now Pavlova. And I'm assuming the next person on stage it will be Edna Mwenda if she's fixed her echo problem. Well, it could be someone else, in which case I'll seamlessly switch to them. Let's see who it is. Yes, it is. Hello. I think you're on mute. Yeah, ready? Take it away. I'm not sure. Edna, can you hear us? Can you know if you can hear us? Because you're on mute and I can't unmute you. I think, yeah, I think you muted, Edna. Can't hear a thing. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I, 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 I cannot unmute you. Um, so, okay, what, I, what we'll do now is, shall we move to Iran, uh, who is, I, I believe, on stage as well now? Sure. Sorry about this, everyone. Um, we, I will still try to sort it. Uh, right. No problem. So instead, we're going to have Irene Eburimpa, who is going to be talking about uh, matched cohort analysis for evaluation of personal health budgets. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So I'm um, Irene Ibirimpa, I work for the Waltham Forest and East London CCGs um, as a population health and financial strategy analyst. Um, and so today I'm just be presenting uh, using our studio in match cohort analysis for the evaluation of personal health budgets. A really kind of easy, catchy title there. Um, so a kind of overview is um, personal health budgets are an kind of innovative way of empowering people with long-term conditions to be involved in their own care planning, working with a care support worker. Um, individuals are given per, uh, budgets that they can use for um, kind of their own decision on uh, something to help them with their care. So they can range from uh, like 80 pound payment up to a thousand pounds. Um, for things like gym memberships or specialised equipment. 
Um, these have been implemented in Tower Hamlets in 2018. I think they're now part of the long-term plan um, for wider implementation across the country. And um, in Tower Hamlets, the personalization strategy team wanted to evaluate the program, um, not only getting feedback from individuals who'd been receiving budget um, personal health budgets, but also to determine if there'd been an impact on health and care spend and activity, which is where I came in and I used our studio to perform the evaluation. Um, so the kind of problem that I had was that I had a small cohort of these, uh, what I'm going to call the treatment group, um, which was 68 individuals referred into the personal health budget program um, for, for things like learning disabilities, long-term conditions or mental health. Um, and we wanted to determine the effectiveness of the budgets on this group um, by creating a control, a control group that can be directly compared that allows us to control for other changes that are happening within the system that might have coincided with the with the program. So I was using programs in R to create a um, an kind of exact matched group that replicate the treatment group. Uh, and this is the process that I went through using R Studio, kind of from importing the data to performing the evaluation. And these are some of the packages that I used for that. I'm going to go through the kind of final three steps. Um, describing the treatment group, creating the control match, and then the evaluation. Um, so to describe the treatment group, I um, so those 68 individuals, I have a, um, we have a linked data set uh, of primary care data that contains patient demographics and clinical characteristics. And then I was able to link this to secondary care data sets um, that contain um, activity and spend in um, like acute services. Um, and so here's kind of part of my script here where I have taken all of the demographic and clinical factors available in the um, primary care data set to determine what factors are the most important um, in the treatment group. And that's when compared to the entire population. So that was kind of 300,000 um, others who did not receive the treatment. Um, and so I used a general linear model to perform that regression. And then these fit were the factors that were the most significant. So it was age, gender, things like asthma, depression, um, learning disability, those things were more significant in the treatment group. So that was what I was gonna use to create the control comparator group. And so in order to do that, um, I used this function called match. Um, and there's a lot of kind of very comprehensive documentation around this. Um, it generates a, um, like a logic p-score from the regression model of the treatment group that I just explained. And each individual in the treatment group is given a, a propensity score. And then the, um, the match function is used to find an individual in the, um, in the kind of whole population that has the same or the closest propensity score to the treatment group. So for example, a male, a 68 year old male with learning disabilities, um, cardiovascular disease and smoking would be matched with someone who had those exact characteristics that just did not receive the personal health budget. And there's lots of kind of parameters within this function that um, you can vary to kind of to control how well the matches. And then there's a balance function as well that is um, you can determine how closely you've been able to match your cohort. Mine was pretty good because we had such a wide pool to, to select from. So that 300,000 kind of other patients or a general population meant that it was easy to find matches for each of the treatment group. And then finally, once I had the um, treatment and control group to determine the impact of the program, I did a comparison between them using kind of negative binomial general linear models um, and then a kind of difference in difference estimated to see how well or, or what difference had occurred kind of before and after the in, um, initiation of the budgets. And, and so in these in these charts here, you can kind of see that looking at acute activity, um, the treatment and control groups, there wasn't that much difference between them um, in that 
the treatment group increased a little bit, but so did the control group. So there was kind of no significant increase in activity. But when it came to spend, um, we could see that the treatment group spend increased, but it didn't increase as much as the control group. Um, and so we thought that maybe uh, individuals with personal health budgets were able to manage their care in a way that meant that prevented kind of acute activity, possibly um, like possibly prevented hospitalizations that were more expensive, I suppose, or spent cost more um, because of the way that they were managing their care differently. And so, yeah, in summary, that was I found that R was a really helpful kind of uh, our studio was a very helpful tool to, to perform this type of evaluation. Um, kind of often we get asked to evaluate um, after the fact and we don't have a perfect um, case controlled study, but it, using these tools, we're able to kind of create a pseudo case control study and we're able to kind of see um, the impact of some of the health care interventions, uh, which was then put into a, the strategy for personalization going forward allowing better monitoring and um, kind of a continuation of the program um, for the future. So thank you. Thanks very much. They're all bang on time, by the way, these talks, which is excellent. So I'm not having to bully people at all. So there's quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, so to combine two of them, what was the name of the, um, the propensity matching package? And what did you, why did you pick that one? Um, there are others to what what appealed to you about that specific one yeah this one is called match and i think i picked this one and this is kind of my experience with r is picking a package where i understand the documentation i guess um because some of the some of the kind of other ones available um i found this one the most easy to use with the data that i had and my level of um capabilities in r so that's why i picked that and another question from the chat is uh will the study be repeated to look over a longer period of time yeah so it's been incorporated into the personalization kind of strategy um and in which i kind of asked also for more data to be collected so we can look at a wider range of wider way a range of factors um and we will i think the plan is to reassess after another year um so taking these this group of patients but then also a wider a, a larger group to then come back to see if we're still seeing um these changes and also looking at other changes as well um not just acute spending activity because that's not the only i think thing of interest or that's not the only area that we want to say that there's been a benefit in uh, one more question is what prompted your choice of negative binomial uh did you was it over dispersed as a press on first um i did a few tests at the beginning to determine which um which regression i should use um and i think that i i think i recall going through some of the checks and finding that um the negative binomial had it fit the the distribution of my data better um but i can't remember exactly i think within the which i should put my script up and GitHub, but within the script, there's the, the kind of checks that I did for, um, for for ensuring that I had the right model fit and then the decision to switch to the negative binomial. Excellent, right, well, thanks very much for your talk and thanks very much for the questions, everybody. And we're gonna move straight on. And I th think it's Edna, I don't know for sure, because I don't know what's going on. Anastasia is working extremely hard in the background. I know Mohammed's listening, so she's, uh, yeah. Now, here we are, yes, it's Edna. Uh, to talk about survival analysis. Take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Edna Mwenda I'm from Kenya. I'm an R and data science enthusiast. I studied actuarial science and graduated just this year. So let me just share my screen and we can just get started. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
So applied survival analysis, I'm just going to get into the introduction of what survival analysis is. So the main, the main event of interest is the time to the occurrence of an event. This could be a death in biological organisms or the failures in mechanical systems. So that is what survival analysis is, just coming up with systems uh, or procedures to determine the time to the occurrence of an event. Some of the examples of survival time include time from death until uh, birth, sorry, until death or the onset of a disease could be cancer, could be coronavirus and so on and so forth. Applied survival analysis in real life uh, could be in terms of uh, different sectors. In engineering, it is known as reliability analysis. In insurance, it could be event history analysis or time to event analysis. In medicine, it is time to event analysis. Okay, so let's look at some of the functions that are used in survival analysis. We have two of the main functions. The first one is survival function and the other one is the hazard function. The survival function is used to represent the probability to the occurrence of an event up to that particular time. For example, ST is the probability of surviving up to time C. So it is one minus the probability of not having survived up to time T. Uh, the hazard function is FT or HT, which is the probability of uh, surviving to a particular time, but uh, suddenly or instantaneously um, dying or not surviving or failure occurring. Mm -hmm. So what are the terms that are used in survival analysis? We have uh, success, you've heard of me saying failure, we have censoring, and we also have the hazard function. So censoring is a form of missing data uh, problem in which the time to the event is not observed. This could be because of loss of follow-up in a certain cohort of, of people, of patients, of machines. We also have withdrawal from the study, for example, if you're determining how many students are going to graduate or how many uh, women are going to contract maybe uh, coronavirus or men that are going to contract maybe cancer or prostate cancer and so on. In that particular study, if someone withdraws, then you're not going to be able to observe that time to the occurrence of an event. Therefore, that leads to censored data. We also have termination of study. If you are to determine how many graduates there are going to be in the year 2020, but some of them, uh, but you decide to end your study in 2019 or a closure of the university or something, then uh, you're going to have censored students or censored data. So uh, what are the types of censoring that uh, observed in survival analysis. The first one is right centering, which is in two forms, the fixed one, uh, type one and type two. Uh, right censoring occurs when a subject leaves the study before an event occurs or the study ends before the event has occurred. That uh, for type one occurs when failure hasn't happened during the termination of the study. That is to say, if you were to determine in a particular cohort, maybe an office, how many people are going to meet a certain uh, to meet a certain target to receive maybe a bonus, then if someone leaves before uh, the termination of the study, then they are going to be uh, a type one center, a fixed type one center uh, that has occurred. We also have random type one centering. This occurs in between, not at any fixed particular time. It could be completely random. We also have type two, which uh, occurs when the study ends uh, at a pre-specified number of events, uh, when a pre-specified number of events have already occurred. For example, you can say if 50% of the insurance policy is mature, then we are going to end uh, the contract. That is to say, that is going to be type two censoring because you have already predict, 
determined um, the number of events that need to have occurred for the study to end. We also have left centering, which occurs when the event of interest has already occurred before enrollment. For example, if someone has already had a clue of what we are doing here in NHS, our community, uh, in this virtual conference, if they already have uh, the videos and all that, then that is going to be a left centered data or person because the event of interest has already has uh, already been uh, known before the study has commenced. We also have interval censoring, which occurs if a subject true, but an observed survival time is within a known time interval. Okay, so let's okay, go to three minutes. Sorry. Three minutes. Okay, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. So what, what are the objectives of survival analysis? The first thing is to estimate the survival function using Kaplan Mayer. We have we also have to interpret that survival function, compare the distribution of survival times in different groups, and to see the relationship between explanatory variables in survival time. We have non-parametric, parametric, and semi-parametric parametric types of uh, Mod models in survival analysis, uh, but I'm just going to focus on Kaplan Mayer and Nelson Allen, but mostly Kaplan Mayer for survival analysis. So I took a case study of uh, the lung cancer in the survival package in R, and I loaded the data as you can see from that code. Mm. So, what are some of the things to do when you're covering our survival analysis. The first one is you need to understand your data. Uh, in our case, the lung data set included uh, the institution code, the survival times in days, the status that is censored or dead or non-censored, the age in years, the, the gender, and so on and so forth. So, Estimating survival distribution using the kaplan mayer method, you use the subfit function in the survival package. You also have to use, the, if you're carrying out survival analysis, you can use the subfit, you can use uh, uh, subminer or KM sub for survival analysis uh, procedures. Now we compare the survival times in different groups. Unfortunately, I don't have the uh, the diagram or the plot for that, but I'm going to send the code, the link to the code, and you can access it from there. Then the cumulative hazard is used to estimate the hazard probability, which is the negative log function of the of the survival function, negative log of ST, which is the survival function. It is used to interpret the cumulative force of mortality or failure. So what are the steps in carrying out model selection? You have to look at the p-value for the log rank test uh, and compare against the significance, your level of significance could be 5% and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat, I don't think. Let me just have a double check. Da, 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 da. No, I can't see any. So I've got a question. So my question would be, uh, obviously, we talk about survival analysis and you think about people dying, but it's used in lots of different uh, contexts in health. So I just wondered if you could say some of the things other than death that people use it for. OK, so survival analysis is used by engineers or in the engineering industry to determine the failure of a machine or the duration a machine is going to fail. Maybe it could be a light bulb going off. It can also be used in medical sense. It can also be applied in the insurance industry to look at the uh, maturity of policies. Great. Thanks very much. Right. We'll move straight on because we're running out of time. Um, yeah. So, and I think the wrong person just appeared, which is a bit confusing. So I think it's Martin Varben next. Uh, talking about a celebration of simple tools and tech to deliver user needs, but I just saw Andreas, so let's see. Oh no, it is Martin. Is it me? I think yes, it might is be you. Me. Take Excellent. it away. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for having me. Very excited to be here. Just hoping the PowerPoint uh, cooperates. Um, so I'm here to. 
celebrate simple tools and tech. We've seen lots and lots of really exciting, novel, innovative stuff, really complex analyses. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about when it is really, really important to just make things really simple. And that is OK. So I'm a lead data scientist. So at the Department for Health and Social Care Data Science Hub, we do all sorts of things. But the reason I'm here today is twofold. One, I'm really keen to learn from all of you, and I'm learning loads. Um, and I'm also here because I want to make sure that we lift the right analysis up for policy making. So I'm really trying to learn lots from what everyone's doing here so that we can start to apply some of that for um, proper national policy, wherever possible. But whenever I say I'm a data scientist, um, I always imagine this sort of thing happens in people's brains. Really, really complicated models, really, really complex algorithms, stuff where you know you put something in, something comes out, no one really knows what happens in the middle, really black box stuff. Um, but actually, in the civil service and in the NHS, data scientists often are just analysts. And when you ask people what they want from analysis, really it's this. I think it's very telling that this dashboard was so extremely um, popular at the beginning of the pandemic, because really it's just counting things. Um, because really what people wanted at the time was clear, clean and correct visuals and numbers. And that is often extremely, extremely powerful. The second thing people want is getting them fast, right? We want these to be as up to date as possible. But really, we don't need to do anything fancy with this um, to still be really, really helpful. So these two things really make up our minimum viable product when we're trying to build stuff that satisfies what the customer wants. So how do we deliver that product? Well, for a lot of people, uh, you want to deliver it fast. And so for ad hoc stuff, often people reach for Excel. Maybe if your trust has Power BI or Tableau or something like that, you might reach for that. But um, as we found out quite painfully quite recently, uh, that, that has limits. Uh, Excel has quite hard limits. And so when you want to do things that are fast and reliable, you might want to think about automation, version control. And those are things that, as you all know, are, are shiny, but also SQL can be really, really good at. And I mentioned this because I consider this a simplification. Because actually what you're doing when you're putting things into R or Shiny, what you're doing is you're, you're doing your quality assurance up front and you're taking out lots of manual error prone steps. And really, when you then get asked for the product again, you have simplified how to get that to your customer. So this is what I mean when I say we want to do something really simple and something reliable. So I'd like to take you back to my life back in March 2020. I think this is very similar to a lot of our lives in March 2020. Hundreds of questions flying around about COVID, about the pandemic, about government interventions. What should we do? Um, and all of these questions were being answered in lots and lots of different ways. But my question was, how do I provide insight into a single simple product that allows domain experts, people who know a lot more than me, to spend more time really thinking about the, the nuances of things. And I simplified all of these questions into a couple of things that I wanted to deliver. I wanted to deliver the visualization, simple, right? That allows domain experts to gain insight quickly, but is also flexible enough to respond to any last minute changes people may have. So questions like, gosh, what happened in the last two weeks as opposed to the last two months? What happened in this country? What happened to that country? And finally, we need to be able to provide this every single day because we were working to extremely tight publication deadlines. We were working, of course, to extremely um, pressured uh, policy making. We wanted to get things right at the right time. And so what I built was this. And this looks extremely busy. This is what, what, a, what a slide might look like. Um, and I'll talk you through what this is. It basically shows for various countries on the y-axis, the cumulative number of cases on the logarithmic scale. And on the x-axis, the number of days since that country reached 100 cases. And this was because, especially early on, you might remember that some countries had the virus introduced at different times. So different countries were at different phases of the pandemic. 
And by starting the x-axis at zero, when that country hits 100 cases, you kind of shift them in such a way that they're roughly in the same place in the pandemic. And then those dots show interventions, government interventions, and when they were taken. And they also had to be shifted according to when in the pandemic they were done. Um, so the dates now correspond on these lines. How did I do that? Well, uh, not very many packages required, frankly. So uh, we used the John Hopkins University data, uh, which was an excellent, excellent data flow. And we made our own list of government interventions that we were interested in internationally. And then we prepared the data with dplyr, tidr, you know, pivot wider, pivot longer. And we wrote our own functions for things like how do we want the names of countries to appear? Um, and by writing a function once, you've simplified that process because you mean it means that you can apply it to any data set and the country names will always come out the same. Um, so that was a really important quality assurance simplification step. And finally, three minutes, please. Sorry, three minutes. Thanks. We drew a visualization, ggplot and ggrepel for the text. We added interactivity, a shiny, and we published it. This was it. There was no more to it. So why is this important to you? Well, because it's all available to you. Uh, so these were used for the evening uh, COVID press briefings, you might remember. So all of those slides are available to you, plus the data set underneath. But we've also published the code so that you do this yourself. So if you ever need a graph along these lines, feel free to use the tool. It's available for anyone. So why do we like simple tools? They're not easy. They're not complex. They're not, you know, they're not cutting edge. They're not super exciting. But they do address what people need. They provide continuous service and they have a real impact. By deciding what your minimum viable product needs to be, you're making sure that what you've built gets used. So any questions? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So we've got some questions in the chat. Um, I'll roll them together. So how many in your team and how long did it take the team to get to grips with that? What were the main challenges? Great question. Uh, there's kind of two two aspects to that. One is how long did it take us to get to grip with the data, which frankly, we ha we were learning along with everyone else. Um, so we, um, the John Hopkins University data was very, very well documented. So we were able to use that very effectively quite quickly. Uh, it was just me working on this. So I built this in about two and a half weeks was the first prototype. Um, and then I've been sort of adding bits and pieces over the course of, of following months. Um, I think to get from absolute nothing to a working tool that everyone was able to use was about a month added all together. Um, and I, I, part of that is publishing it and, you know, making, making sure everybody's happy with me publishing it. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a question, which is, I, I mean, I, I really like the idea of simple, clear and concise. But I just want to play devil's advocate for a moment, just to because I was talking about this the other day. So the thing that I said in the meeting the other day was Henry Ford's thing about if we asked the customers what they wanted, all they wanted is a faster horse. So I wondered what you have to say. What's the other? What you think about the other side of the argument? I think that's a really good point. I, I keep saying that to people as well. Um, I think the crucial thing is that the, the advantage we have on our side of this aisle is we know the art of the possible. So when someone tells us. I'm trying to answer this question. You know what you have, so the toolkit that's at your disposal and what, you know, through tutorials, through workshops, you've seen what people can do. Um, so when you're presented with a question, you do still have quite a lot of flexibility in how you think you want to answer it and how you think you want to make the tool as intuitive as possible rather than make a bar chart for the sake of a bar chart. Um, and this the whole workshop about visualization options is exactly one of those things. People may not realize what the effective way is until you've shown them, um, which is great. But still, even in that case, simplifying QA, simplifying your code, functionizing things, all of that will always help you. Very good. Words to live by. OK, thank you very much. Uh, right now we have the final talk. We're beautifully to time. Thanks to our speakers. Nothing to do with me. So this is our very own Andreas presenting work that he did not do with us. Um, it's a COVID-19 risk profiling dashboard. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. 
Hello? Yeah, okay, yes. you can hear me. Hi, uh, thanks for the intro, Chris. Uh, yes, so I'm Andreas, I'm a data scientist in uh, the NHS Nottingham Shared Healthcare. I'm unfortunately, I'm unfortunate enough to be managed by Chris, who is chairing the session, but that's, uh, that's another story. So let's uh, let's kick off. Uh, there has been a slight change in the presentation, so I won't be talking about the dashboard itself because there are some data sensitivity issues where, due to which I cannot really present the dashboard. But uh, I will be talking about my own experience of how I built the dashboard, and I'll show you a dummy version of it to get an idea of, of how it looks like. So I think my my presentation is uh, targeted at people who uh, are are necessarily experienced our users, but uh, users who know their way around, and they would like to uh, also explore the possibility of uh, uh, developing their own uh, dashboard at some point. So hopefully this uh, presentation will be uh, um, will motivate and, uh, people and give some pointers to to get them started. So just to uh, give you an idea of how the dashboard looks like, this is a dummy version of it. Okay, so that this data is just you know uh, open data that. Uh, you know, they're just uh, dummy data about population uh, profiles uh, per local authority and age group in England. So we have, what we have here is a dashboard with a reactive table where you can actually uh, sort the values to, to compare the different uh, local authorities in terms of population. You have some uh, square, uh, you know, some rectangles here uh, to uh, um, separate your, say, key indicators from uh, in other indicators, sub-indicators, uh, that are represented by rounded uh, rectangles. And then, you know, there is some interactivity going on. You know, if you click on a local authority, you get a map. The map shows you uh, the darker the color, the higher the population is in this local authority. The circle represents the percentage of the population in England. So you can make comparisons in terms of color and the circle size. And here you have a population pyramid uh, for each local authority. So that's pretty much, that was the structure of the actual dashboard, which of course has nothing. I mean, it was about COVID. This is a, uh, just with dummy data, but just to give you an idea, and now I will uh, talk about uh, how I did it. Uh, to begin with, I am um, well, but I had no experience whatsoever with uh, with dashboards. And that's very important to, to, to mention because when you enter the the world of dashboards, there is uh, there are a lot of elements in there that, as an R user, you do not necessarily uh, deal with uh, when you're coding. Uh, elements such as reactive tables, uh, flex dashboards, and uh, R markdown, HTML and CSS for styling your your dashboard, and then of course uh, you know Shiny for interactive elements and uh, Plotly, you know if you want to add some Plotly and like that, and um, so. I knew uh, ggplot very well. Uh, I've been using it for years. I know uh, Shiny, I knew Shiny, but the very basic things I had built, very basic uh, apps. So I had to somehow bring all, the, all of this together and build a dashboard. My initial approach to the, to the problem was, okay, well, I don't know HTML, I don't know CSS, I don't know Shiny, that's well. Let's look at uh, each one of them in isolation. Uh, take a look on, on, online, you know, at the W3 schools or whatever, you know, see what uh, what examples are in there. But I found this approach very difficult to deal with because uh, when you look at each element separately, then yeah, it may make sense, you know, trivial, simple, trivial examples may make sense. Like, for example, with CSS, maybe you have two rectangles that are colored differently and how you can, you know, what's a command to position them uh, in an overlapping manner and things like that. Okay. But when you're trying to, to build something more professional and more complex, then looking at all of these things in isolation uh, doesn't help you because you don't know how to integrate them. So I took a completely different approach. I started looking at what other people uh, have done. So there are uh, three uh, references here that there, there are links to, to those websites so you can take a look at your own time. Uh, the two first ones are uh, they were built with our code. The third one, I, I I decided it here because there are some very cool ideas in terms of a uh, simple yet impactful uh, visualization. So in terms of the first two, I just took the code of, of these two uh, dashboards and I started uh, cutting it into smaller pieces, if you like. So I took the code and the data that was available. I made sure that the dashboards that those people uh, offer uh, online for free 
work on my computer and then I started making changes by adding my own data that I know I know the data very well so I know where to to look at uh, you know uh, how they are represented on the dashboard how they, they visualize and things like that the big advantage when you're learning how to build a dashboard is that you can always see the changes I mean what you're doing is that you're visualizing uh, something so you make a change you visualize it you see that something has changed and you know you, you work in this way so this helped me quite a lot to work out different things, uh, what the the purpose of different elements on the dashboard uh, was. Like, for example, this uh, weird CSS type of, uh, of coding that I wasn't familiar with before, that I started noticing that, for example, well, I have an object uh, that's called table. So if you refer to this uh, object by dot table, then inside the brackets, you can start changing things and those things like the font size and things like that will uh, change on the dashboard. So, for example, if you uh, increase the font size massively, it's very easy to spot where the change actually happens on the dashboard and it can help you, you know, get more control of, uh, you know, how the whole thing works. The same with HTML, you know, those we this weird syntax that I wasn't familiar with before. Uh, you know, I started getting familiar, you know, familiarizing myself with it by doing changes and uh, visualizing them and seeing what has changed. So uh, I must say that I, I never really mastered uh, HTML, CSS and other elements that were in the dashboard. But this is not the point here. You don't really have to master them. You just need to have a good idea of uh, like how, you know, more or less what they do and how they work. And by trial and error, a little bit of experimentation, changing things on your dashboard, changing, you know, elements, uh, colors, fonts, and things like that, you start getting it, you know, you start getting how the whole thing works. So don't be put off if you don't know HTML or CSS and things like that. Just, uh, uh, you know, it will be, I think it will be very easy for you to, to catch up with those elements anyway, because what you need from those elements is a more the, um, the specific commands that will help you customize and build your dashboard exactly the way you want. So you don't really need to be a master uh, in any of these uh, uh, different elements, just you know, uh, to have an idea of how they work. Um, I would say that uh, without open source, I wouldn't have been able to build a dashboard. So uh, being able to access uh, open source code of more professionally built dashboards helped me an awful lot. So I would say just take a deep dive, a deep dive to something more complicated rather than uh, working on trivial examples. And then you can work your way backwards in order to uh, uh, to customize the open source code to, to your particular needs. Two minutes. Uh, two minutes? OK, thanks. I'm almost over anyway. So uh, an extra. Uh, is that the real life dashboards uh, often have maps and it's also uh, i think it's always pretty cool to practice geocoding to be able to you know to uh, to code the map and uh, add things on the map maps are always you know very helpful and as you can see on, on the dummy dashboard you know it, it can be quite illuminating in terms of what the indicators are and how they differ between local authorities and things like that uh, so i hope to have uh, motivated you and have given you some uh, pointers to to get started with uh, with building your own dashboard. And if you would like to access my own code, just take a look at the uh, at the link at the public link on, on GitHub that I have provided on on the slides. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for that. Uh, so we have a question in the chat already. Uh, can you suggest a good resource that explains reactivity in Shiny? I have to hijack that question briefly and say there's actually a workshop that I'm running next week, so that would be a good resource. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure Andreas knows some as well. Uh, I would say that Chris Chris is very experienced in Shiny, so you should absolutely join this if you can. Uh, now, in terms, I mean, what I would suggest is, uh, well. I, I, Trial and error, as I said, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I read a lot of resources online and, you know, examples of how, how things work, but without getting my hands dirty, I never, you know, I didn't feel confident enough. So I really wanted to get my hands dirty and learn how the, the whole reactivity things 
uh, thing works in shiny. So that's how that's how I did it. Um, just can see if we've got any more questions. We're a little bit over time anyway, so I think we'll we'll leave this question. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm not thank sure. You. If uh, Anastasia is going to reappear again, I think she probably is. Uh, but I'm going to. Oh yes, there she is. Over to you, Anastasia. Thank you, thank you, Chris, uh, for managing and facilitating. Um, it was absolutely amazing set of talks, very diverse, and uh, it was amazing to hear about uh, people who do a lot of COVID work as well as uh, doing uh, shiny, doing some statistical analysis uh, with uh, much cohorts. Uh, just very quick one uh, for tomorrow. So hopefully I uh, will share my screen uh, without any problems. Um, so we have, uh, as usually in the morning, we will be having about uh, um, six sessions. I know some people asked about uh, having uh, um, health economics and uh, is there any resources for our health economics. Uh, yes, we will have two sessions about health economics, one from uh, Gianluca and one from uh, Robert. Uh, we will also hear from Sarah Colkin from NHSX. I'm sure Sarah is here listening to talks. Um, we will hear from Chris Maney. Uh, we will have guests from Virgin Media talking about uh, analytics. And last but not least, we will have uh, Rebecca Kilik, uh, who some of you might know from the uh, course on change point analysis. Uh, we will then have lightning talk session. They will start a bit later tomorrow. Uh, so I will see you at 3 p.m. Uh, as usually amazing uh, range of speakers and talks. And we will have session at quarter past four uh, with one of keynote speakers uh, who will be tuning all the way from New York. Uh, that's why I will have to go for late afternoon. So please make sure to join us with Alberto Cairo. He is absolute legend in um, visualizing data and uh, he has a book on how charts lie. Uh, I'm sure many of you might have heard of him. Uh, so please join us. And um, I think this is pretty much it from me. Uh, thank you again to our speakers. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for everyone for attending uh, day two of the conference. And I will see you tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>